the Assistant VP of Marketing and External Affairs at Copel Solutions, and I want to welcome you all here today. We're excited to have all of you. Um, also, want to thank Efrain for putting this together and Alice as well. Um, and then I want to bring er uh, Derek up here to talk a little bit about our CCE program. Awesome. How are you guys feeling tonight? Great. Great. That's awesome. Take the energy. Let's start off with that. How many of you guys are in the CCE program? Um, I just want to see a show of hands. How many guys are already in it? Oh, wow. Yeah, all right. So how many guys are not in the CCE program? We got a couple. All right, so maybe like a third of the room, right? We got to get you in. I know, see? That's, that's already where I want to go with it. So I'm sure all of you guys that are in the program can probably vouch for what I'm saying or what I'm going to say. But for you guys that are not in the program, just want to share with you that this is probably the premier hands-on clinical experience that you can't find anywhere else in Southern California. If you're looking to get hands-on clinical patient experience, this is the program that you want to be in. Um, I'm not even joking. Um, I, I should have introduced myself a little better, Derek Bustos, the assistant manager at Riverside. Um, I was a clinical care center about five months ago, and hey, sorry, I see some friends in the room. Hey, friends. Um, and because I was a clinical care extender, you know, I transitioned into becoming manager, and what I wanted to do was go back and be a volunteer. I said, hey, I'm talking to my supervisor, Alice, can I go back and be a CCE? I want clinical experience. She said, unfortunately, that's something you can't do. But what you can do is look into other programs, and maybe you can get your clinical experience that way. So I did some research, called up a bunch of different hospitals, um, called up some programs in Orange County, because that's where I'm from, and I realized that there is, there is not anything else that you can do that's similar to the scope of practice of a CCE. So if that's something that you're looking for, this is a program that you should be a part of, okay? Um, I know I was supposed to cut my speech a little bit shorter than what I usually do, um, but I figure I have a little bit of time to give. <laughs> so, um, the reason why this program is probably the best thing that I've ever been a part of is because people come into medicine for a couple reasons. I'm going to start out when I was an undergrad at Cal Poly Pomona, I only knew about physicians and nurses. Not even going to lie, that's all I knew. I joined the CCE program as a senior um, in 2013, and I realized that there is so much more to healthcare than just physicians and nurses. If you're not exactly sure what you want to do or where you want to be, but you know you want to be in a hospital, join the program because you'll get exposed to it. You'll learn about PAs, you'll learn about NPs, you'll learn about healthcare admin. That's an avenue I had no idea about, but it's something that you can be exposed to as well. Um, so there are so many things that you can be exposed to in this program, uh, aside from just clinical experience. So you guys that are interested, that are in this room, I imagine everybody's pre-med. That's why you guys are here for a surgical specialty panel, right? Right. Okay, I thought so. Um, I want to let you guys know some of the cooler things that I've been able to do um, as a CCE. I was able to be in the operating room. I was able to see firsthand a heart surgery, a brain surgery, a total hip replacement. Um, I was able, I don't know if this is within the scope of practice of the CCE, but <laughs> <laughs> the chief of surgery actually came up to me. He was performing a surgery, he stepped away after he finished up operating on the left carotid artery of a patient, taking out some plaque. He pulled it out and he said, Derek, come here, put on some gloves. I was like, okay. So I came over. I was like, Dr. Ashley, is this something, this is something I can do? He's like, yeah, take a look, touch this. And I was touching it, it's plaque. I was like, okay, I'm touching plaque, but what is it supposed to feel like? He said, it's not supposed to be that hard, it's supposed to feel like jello. Um, what kind of experience, or where else do you get to do that? Where else are you scrubbing in, talking to a surgeon, somebody that's so experienced, so seasoned, and that's willing to take you under their wing and shadow, or allow you to shadow them? Um, it's something that's difficult to do, something that's hard to find. Um, I'm not saying that it's spoon-fed to you, in the clinical care extender program, but you're gonna have opportunities to reach out to individuals that can do that for you. Um, I think that we have all our panelists here, so I'm gonna wrap it up, but if you guys have any questions about the CCE program, I'm gonna be around, I'm actually pre-med, just like a lot of you guys, and so I'm here to hear these ladies and gentlemen speak about you know, their specialties and their experiences in medicine, but I can help you guys maybe um, gain a little bit more clinical experience before we even get into medical school. So, without further ado, without further ado, I'm gonna, give it up to these guys and allow them to be the stars of the show because that's what you guys are all here for. So, take it away. Good evening everybody, my name is Efrain Talamantes and I'm part of, not, I'm a COPE alumni and also part of Mi Mentor and one of our missions is to really increase access to mentors and one of the ways that we want to do this is to having these types of panels where you get to really hear an insight 
an inside scoop as to how these very successful individuals were able to get into the field of medicine, uh, what were some of the, the key things that were able to support them, and also uh, give you a chance to ask questions. And so we have a few questions prepared, but I really want to encourage you to start thinking about you know, having these uh, mega specialists here who, who work on, on different fields of surgery um, they have very different perspectives and at some point you know have the same questions you had uh, and, and I'm gonna ask them to really reflect on, on their experiences and try to put themselves in your shoes um, and, and try to help you out whether you're interested in surgery or you're kind of or you're sort of looking for your calling we hope that some of these answers will spark some sort of interest in you to take that next step and be successful in whatever career you choose. Um, our first panelist actually is not here, um, and he actually works here at St. Francis, uh, Mikey Jimenez, he's a trauma surgeon, and he always likes to come late and sort of have a grand entrance, so I know that's what he's doing tonight, but he'll be here, uh, unless he's operating. Um, but we have uh, the rest of our panelists here who, um, come from very different places, but share commonalities with you. Uh, Dr. Sammy, and uh, we used to know him as Sam and Sammy. He's actually a couple years ahead of us in, in medical school at UCLA, and so I got to go to many of his uh, social uh, fundraisers, and he was always raising money for really good causes. Uh, and was very successful in getting a lot of us out there, so. Uh, I still remember those, those great times we had and conversations that he would sort of share with us about his passion for underserved communities. Um, and we could see that, that as you guys read his bio, it started with Coke uh, and really giving him a chance to give back. Um, and now he's a vascular surgeon um, in the process of finding a job. And hopefully he'll come back to Southern California and so he'll be able to participate in more of our events. Um, Dr. Claudia Sevilla is a urologist at the University of uh, Southern California. Um, go Trojans. Did you really say that? I'm a Bruin. Yeah, did you really just <laughs> There is a UCLA game right tonight. Yeah. Dude. But she is a Bruin at heart. Yes. She's a Bruin at heart because she went to the UCLA School of Medicine as well. And I got to meet Claudia. Um, and sort of served as her surrogate mentor at times, although she was going in, into a, a surgical field, and I'm in internal medicine. So we were still able to share uh, insights uh, as to how she could participate in, in health services research, which she was very successful in publishing various articles uh, that are looking at how to support uh, women who are Latina who have urological uh, disorders. Um, and she's done uh, work around uh, globally in Mexico specifically. Um, so that's Claudia. Uh, Dr. Luis Macias, uh, who was one of my mentors when I first started uh, medical school, um, and I got to know him throughout the years, and he's sort of done so many fascinating things. He's actually a veteran, um, so he was out in the military before he went to UCLA undergrad and then went on to complete his uh, medical education at the School of Medicine. Uh, he did a um, uh, fellowship and reconstructive plastic surgery at the Mayo Clinic and now is back here in Southern California in Marina Plastic so if you have any referrals I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, you know he's always been sort of the big brother big mentor to many of us and so anytime we ask him to show up he does it and he does it really well even so though there's really an UCLA ASU game going on yeah, right yeah. now right <laughs> so we're on a tight timeline so we can see the second half <laughs> And then uh, Dr. Luis Corrales, uh, who's an orthopedic surgeon uh, in Pomona, uh, he went to uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, went on to UCSF for sur uh, surgery, orthopedic surgery. Uh, but what's neat about his story is he actually spent a whole year in Australia uh, doing a fellowship in, uh, in uh, his specialty. And he'll tell you more a little bit more about the details. Uh, but He's also someone who's very dedicated to uh, underserved communities. He grew up uh, here in, uh, in the Echo Park area, um, and now is back in Pomona, which is a highly underserved area. And he's able to take care of many patients um, that have and do not have insurance. And so it's a really neat experience to have him back. So with that, any one of you can start. You don't have to feel like you have to be in order. Uh, at what stage in your educational or in your career 
um, I think many of us, even later in our career, feel confident right, that we did the right thing. But what was it that you felt confident? Because I think many of us you know, question what we want to do, especially when it's something like surgery, because we've been socialized to, to think that it's so difficult. But when did you feel confident that this was your calling? Uh, and was there one or a series of transformational moments? And if you could talk a little bit about that one moment or a couple of uh, experiences that really helped you hone in and say, this is what I'm going to do. No matter how hard it is, this is what I'm going to stick to. And, and you guys were successful in doing that. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Way to get out of this first. So I think um, for me it was interesting because I felt like I knew I wanted to go into surgery from the very beginning. Even when I was in high school, like I loved all of my chemistry classes, I loved hands-on experiments, I did a lot of shadowing during undergrad, I was also in CC, and so I knew right away like I want to do surgery, I really love it, I like being hands-on. And it wasn't until I got into medical school and actually learned about other specialties and rotated through surgery that I started getting doubts. Um, a couple of those doubts, I think, were related to being a woman. I was getting older. I knew I wanted to have a family. I saw how few female surgeons there were out there. All the ones that I knew were either divorced or never married. I think a part of it, too, is just realizing what a big sacrifice it was. The residency programs themselves are much longer, and it was going to be a a longer sacrifice. So I, I think that really made me question whether I really wanted to do it. And I think for me, it took taking a year off in medical school and doing some research in urology, which was a subspecialty that kind of had a little bit of both. There's a lot of um, problems that you don't treat surgically, so you're seeing a lot of patients the same way a family doctor would. And there are other problems that you treat surgically. So it was a good combination of both things and I got to do some research in it and really learn about it. And for those of you who don't know what urology is, because not everyone does, I didn't until I got into medical school. It's basically the study or the sur surgery on the kidneys, the bladder, the prostate, and all the male genitalia. So I'm like the, the male OB guy. Uh, but it took that year off for me to really realize, like, okay, I can have a little bit of everything by choosing urology. And that's for me kind of when I realized, okay this is what I want to do. But it did take that one year of taking off time and really thinking about it before I finally decided. Because I think up until I got to med school, I was so gung-ho about surgery, but then I got like a reality check when I got to med school, and I was like, crap, this is not what I was expecting. So it took the year off for me to know. Thank you. All right, I just saw one actually. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I, wanted, when I went into medical school. I just knew I wanted to be a doctor. Um, you got to be careful your first rotation when you're a third year, you're all excited to be a doctor or start practicing as a doctor. My first rotation was OBGYN and I loved it. I was going to be an OBGYN. And so then we had this longitudinal perceptorship where you went to go hang out with an OBGYN. And he was a really great guy, but I remember every time I, it was like once every month or something, you had to go visit this, this, this surgeon or OBGYN doctor. And I remember going, well, I hope he's not doing OB. And I hope, next best, I hope he's in clinic. Dying clinic, and then I hope he's in the operating room. And that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, wait, I really like the operating room. I want to be a surgeon. So I did my surgery rotation very, very last in my third year, but I loved it. And then I couldn't decide what kind of surgeon, so I said, I'll be a general surgeon. So I did all in general surgery residency. And then in general surgery residency, I really loved cardiothoracic surgery and plastic surgery, and I kind of liked them equally. And I had a mentor. It's all about mentorship. I had a mentor who was like, look, if you can get into plastics, which getting into plastics is probably not as hard as ortho or, or urology, but it's up there. Um, it, it, they said if you can get into that, then you know you should probably go that route. It's a decent lifestyle, which that it is. Um, and cardiothoracic is quite the opposite. It's uh, up all night, but I did love heart transplants. I, it was a tough choice, but uh, I applied to plastics and fortunately was able to get in and then did a couple fellowships after that, which we can talk about later. But uh, it's uh, just a whole bunch of series. There's you know interesting things that you do in each field, and in plastics there was this and that. And so I did a couple more specialties, and it was it's just a fun round. Um, I didn't care about how long it took. I'm now 40. I just started my practice a couple years ago. Um, but you know, I can have kids till I'm 60. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> or later, you know, I got a buddy who's a fertility doc, so he can. He can so I wasn't I wasn't in a hurry. Well, um, 
for me, it was similar to Dr. Lucia's. Uh, I just really wanted to get into med school. It's funny because you know you, you want to be a doctor, but then there's so many different types of doctors you can be. Um, so I didn't really know what kind of. Actually, I thought I wanted to be a cardiologist. So I was I was confused initially um, with the medicine route, but uh, I came around. For me, it was uh, third year. So you really don't get a true flavor until you start doing the clerkships and you're actually in there and kind of in the trenches. Um, I really liked surgery. I hated the bowel, so I knew I couldn't do general surgery. Um, but when I did my orthopedic rotation, I thought, man, these guys are, and girls are super cool, dedicated. The surgeries were awesome. Uh, patients were very happy. No, uh, nobody dies usually, so that's a positive. <laughs> and, um, that's how I do. Um, let's see. Probably the first question you guys are all thinking is like, these guys are all talking about how great surgery is, but how do I get into medical school, right? <laughs> so I think getting to medical school is easy. Um, it really is. You're dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm well, going to tell you that it's really easy to get into medical school. It's actually really hard. It gets harder every year. And uh, what's really challenging is picking a career. I mean, it's, you know, there's only one path in medicine. It's going off the ladder. You know, every level you take a test and you get promoted. It's not like business. It's not like you're going out there in the stock market. There's ups and downs. Medicine is a very rewarding field. You know, you study, you take an exam, and you get promoted. So it's really exciting knowing that that's all you got to do: study and pass the tests. Um, for me, I chose surgery because it was the best rotation I had as a medical student. It was very decisive. I love decision making. No offense to medicine, but I couldn't stand the medicine rounds because we would stand there all day. It was torture, you know. They're talking about ten different diseases. I'm like, come on, this is an abscess. You just strain it. <laughs> but you know, so for me, I always wanted a field that was very decisive. Um, I could make a decision. I could change, you know, the patient's life fairly quickly. Um, I didn't know what type of surgical field I would like, so I chose general surgery initially and uh, pursued that, and then once I was in my general surgery rotation, I really fell in love with transplants, and I liked vascular work, and kind of pursued vascular surgery from there. So, you know, and obviously, like, this kind of pertains to the third question, which is, like, you know, if you were sitting here in the audience, what would you tell yourself? Like, hey, this guy can do it, I can. So, <laughs> that's what I'm here to tell you, that I can do it, you guys can, I'm sure. You know, it's nothing, you know, never think that it's not possible, that's really, my advice, at least from going to surgery, it's actually ended up being so much easier than medicine, I think. I could never do internal medicine, so. But I love <laughs> Yes. I'm going to take you guys rounding with me. <laughs> <laughs> Torture. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, you know, many times um, we have this perception that surgery is a very intense, difficult, no life kind of role. Um, how true is that, and, and if so, or how do you balance all the competing demands that you have, or, or what are some of the things that helped you uh, learn how to balance your life? Because you could easily be in the hospital saving lives and getting all these rewards all the time if you really wanted to. <laughs> Well, there's more females than males here, so they're all curious what you're going to say. <laughs> On, to be completely honest, I still don't feel like I've accomplished that or figured, uh, figured out a good way to do that. I feel like every rotation that I go through, because I'm still in residency, is a, it's a constant battle to, to figure out how to manage your time efficiently. You know, there's days where I'm at the hospital till 11 o'clock at night and I literally want to like quit or cry or kill myself. <laughs> but then, you know, you have other days where it's like, this is great, I went to the gym today, I got so many errands done, and I saw my patients in the morning, and so you think everything's great. And I mean, that's the thing about it, it changes all the time, and you really just have to learn how to kind of take it day by day. And I really don't feel like I have a good answer to it. Just kind of, you got to just take it day by day and not let the bad days get you down. And, you know, it always happens where you'll have one day that's tough and one day that's good. And even on those bad days, though, there's usually some patient that you'll encounter that will remind you why you're doing it. And I think overall that's what you have to keep in mind is 
you know, this is why you're doing it, regardless of what challenges come your way, the most important thing is the patient, and they constantly remind you of that. So I feel like even though I've had a lot of challenges, like that kind of keeps me afloat. Yeah, I did nine years of residency uh, and pup fellowship and training, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So there's two residencies, two fellowships, nine years. Um, so I know exactly what she's talking about. But that mentor that helped me choose sort of lifestyle, I look back and I thank him big time because during those nine years, I was like, bam, 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 I'm going to be, you know, the man, I'm going to be the best at everything, I'm going to be chairman of this and this and that, and I was just like, head in the, in the sand, I was going to do it all. And I didn't care about lifestyle, quite honestly, because uh, my lifestyle was around the hospital. I had my friends at the hospital, you know, I went, I dated people from the hospital. I mean, it was, my life was a stay in the hospital. Um, but it was, you know, you make a bunch of friends, it's like everything, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it was a cool social, we all hung out, it was fun, it was really fun. Um, but I knew that it, at some point that would end. So I'm happy that I chose a specialty where my lifestyle is a little better than I, if I would have been a cardiothoracic surgeon. And, and now I, I have most of the evenings to myself. You know, I go to football games on the weekends. Um, I, you know, I'm on call every now and then. I'm actually uh, a volunteer faculty at USC for plastic surgery, so I, I'm there sometimes. Um, and it's fun to be able to volunteer uh, my time with the residents at USC because I've got extra time. But it is busy to build a practice. So comparatively to when I was a resident, I have less time. But when I was a resident, I was putting in 80 hours a week. And that's only because it's mandated at 80. When I first started, that mandate wasn't in. It was 110, 115, 20 hours a week. Um, but now, 80 hours, some weeks would be 90, some weeks would be 60, because it's on average. Um, but that includes sleeping in there. And you're sleeping at the hospital. It's not like you're working every one of Sometimes you get to sleep when you're <laughs> um, I mean, I think whatever residency you do, medicine, surgery, it's a challenging time. Uh, no way around it. I think you have to accept that. You know, during that time, you're going to work hard because that's what you're there to do. You better learn as much as you can, get as much experience as you can. Um, there's going to be times when you you rebel, right? Because your friends and other people uh, have more of a life than you do, and but you do have, you know, when you have free time, you take advantage of it, you know. You gotta have a balanced life, uh, take care of your, yourself, exercise, go out, have fun when you can, but, but you have to accept that you're gonna work at least 80 hours a week. And I think uh, when you come to terms with that, you're, you're okay. If every day you expect to get out early and have less work, you're gonna be miserable. You have to accept that you're gonna work hard and, and do the best you can. So, you know, in, in medicine, you're going to work hard in every field. Um, what's cool about surgery is that you, all the hours that you put in, you're always exhausted, but you get to see all the action. That's the part that I love, you know. I mean, you know, I, when I was doing my general surgery rotation, we had a guy that came in with a fractured penis. You know, it goes to urology. That's, I thought that was cool. <laughs> well, it's crazy, you know. Or if you're doing trauma, you get to see basal skull fractures, you get to see crazy degloving injuries, and all the ER docs run away, and you're the general surgery resident going in, like, oh man, this is great, you know. You're like, you know, everybody's like, wanting to take pictures, you know, like, no, this is my patient, you know, you're putting it all back together. Or even orthopedics, you get to see crazy open uh, fractures. So, you know, with all the hard work, you get to see a lot of the action, and that's if that's something in you that drives you, you love that rush, surgery is the field for me, that's what I love. I love ruptured triple A's, I love when patients come in in traumas, they got, you know, mangled extremities, and you know, they call us in for revascularizations, I think that's great, you know, and no matter how tired you are, believe me, you haven't slept for 48 hours, you haven't slept for 24 hours because you're working, and you get that one case, you feel like you just had like 10 hours of sleep. Because you get so excited, the adrenaline rush is great. So if that's your personality, that will work. Uh, and you'll get through it. You won't know how you did it, but you'll get through it, you know. <laughs> so, and all of us can tell you, we've all had those moments, you know, in our residencies or in our fellowships that, you know, we really felt like we're exhausted, we can't do anymore. And then you get that one case that comes in you've never seen before, and you're there for another four or five hours. And 
it just keeps you going. You know, and what's exciting now is that obviously there's a lot of uh, things about time, so you're you don't have to really think about you being exhausted anymore. Um, the controlled amount of hours you guys put in uh, is watched by ACG and me now, and a lot of fields are becoming super specialized. You know. Uh, which is great because you can stop how much you want to specialize in the field that you're going into. So, based on the quality of life you want to have, and based on you know what you like to do with your career, whether or not you like to go into private practice, academics. So, I think that the challenges of surgery are definitely there because you really have to be dedicated, and that's a decision you have to make fairly early. You have to decide whether or not you want to go through it. Um, and surgery is a little bit unique because once you get into it, everything else seems easier. You know, when you switch fields, you know, I've had colleagues that they did surgery for two or three years and they went into radiology because they couldn't handle the hours and they're like, man, nothing is like surgery. So, and this is just all types of surgery, it's not just, you know, any specific field. I want to add, I sound pretty negative now that I think about what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Sorry. What, yeah, no, what I meant is that you have to you have to do your time, right? Residency, no matter what you do, is hard. But when you're done, I mean, you have, like, you're so highly trained. And you have a, such a skill set. And, and you have the freedom to do anything you want with that. And you have full control over what you want to do. And it's really at that point where, you know, you, your lifestyle is whatever you want it to be. But, of course, during that time in residency, you don't always have that freedom or that, um, you know, your life isn't always, you know, great, but, um, but you're doing what you love, right? And so that's what keeps you going. And it's exciting, and some days it's hard, and some days you don't sleep, but you, know, you look back on it, and you're like, man, I did some, some pretty amazing things. And, and, and you're still going to do more amazing things in the future, so that's, I mean, you know, it's worth the, it really looks. I think, like, also to add on to that, too, I think a big part of being able to overcome, like, the challenge of going into surgery and, you know, getting through residency and stuff is just who, you're, who you surround yourself with. You know, you have to have a good support group, um, and you, you, you need that to be able to get through. If you have somebody who's constantly fighting for your attention or who is demanding something from you, I know in some situations it's harder if you have kids already, but um, I'm talking about friends or, you know, significant others. They really need to be supported because it's going to make it that much harder. And your life at home and around you outside of the hospital needs to be as easy as possible because it's going to be so hard while you're at the hospital. And I think in your case, it's easy if all your friends are at the hospital and stuff, but that's not going to be the case for anyone. Just, just live in the hospital. <laughs> it's good to surround yourself with people who are going to be very supportive because that makes it a lot easier. A lot easier. I, I remember my sister. My father died last year, and, and I was just moving here. My sister was like, she told me, like, I need your help with this certain part. And I'm like, yeah, I'm happy to help. So you just, you've been gone so long for all these years, and I've taken care of everything with mom and dad, and da da da. And I just, oh, I felt so bad. I'm like, of course I'll take care of that. And I took care of you know everything I could now that I live here again. But for many years I didn't live here, and I couldn't take care of things, and my sister had to take care of it. She never really said anything until I was back, and she's like, I really need your help, and I felt so bad. But it's one of those things that other people are going to have to help you and be understanding and, and, and take care of other things that you're not going to be able to get to. I think in situations, too, where people are dependent on you, it's, it's necessary that you take them into account when you're choosing what you do. If, if, you, if you being around is going to affect them, like if you do have a kid or something, then I think that that should take into account because honestly, like if you can't give yourself 100% to your residency in surgery, you shouldn't do it because you're going to be cutting into people. You know what I mean? It's, it's a big deal. So I really, really think, you know, because I've seen people get into residency and they quit after their first or second year because they had other responsibilities that mattered more, and I feel like they should have thought about that. They could have saved a lot of money and a lot of time if they would have just taken those other people into account or taken their life situation into account before choosing because it is such a big sacrifice, and it requires all of your attention. On the other hand, every girl in the plastic surgery department at USC uses their residency in order to make it the time to marry a neurosurgeon and start a family. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I am, I am 
I'm not married to another physician, just to right? So, neural surgeons. So, no kidding, I think there are like 60% women in the, in, the, in the USC plastic surgery department, and, and every single one of them has had a child during residency. So, and has finished their residency in, in the last three years that I've seen, that I've been, that I've been there and seen it. So, it, it is possible, yeah. but you just have to have supportive people to help you. Uh, without, without focusing on these extremes, you guys are getting relationship advice. <laughs> Beyond getting into medical surgery. This is Gray's Anatomy, guys. <laughs> At its best. New season. Yes. Uh, without being, you know, uh, focusing on the extremes, if you could just give us your typical day, like what are the most common days you have in which you do vascular surgery, urology, plastics, or orthopedics? Like you get up and what time and sort of what your day looks like. Get home about what time? Just to just to kind of give, yeah, like what you do during the day. And, and I know again the most common days, not the extremes. But some days could be really heavy. Some days could be really light. But the more common days for you. So, so I'm currently in my last year of training in vascular surgery. Um, so my life is still like in training mode. Um, although I'm kind of here for interviewing this uh, this few days here. So usually my day starts around 4:45 uh, is when I wake up. It takes me about like um, 30 minutes to do my whatever routine things that I do, and then usually I work by 5:20. Uh, where I train is very fellow-driven program, which means that the fellows are involved in all aspects of the care of the patient. So we round on patients. Usually we have anywhere from like 35 to 75 patients that we round on every morning. Um, so that goes usually from 5.30 to 7 o'clock. Then from 7 to 7.15, we go see our patients in the preoperative area. We have to mark the site that we're going to be operating on, speak with them if anything has developed since we've seen them last in the clinic. But then 7.15, we always have basketball conference uh, in our department. So we go there for the next 35, 40 minutes while the anesthesiologists are getting the patient ready, getting them to the operating room, intubating them setting up lines, getting arterial lines, so on and so forth. Uh, during our vascular conference, we're doing all the cases that we're going to be operating on. And then, uh, he's actually one of my boys from medical school. <laughs> What's up, buddy? And, uh, and then from there, we go back to surgery and... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't told you what was in, man. I haven't seen him forever. Oh. We did med school together, so. <laughs> Sign later. <laughs> we were about to bring that poster. <laughs> Put it right here. See, let me let me just say just one one quick thing. I didn't know that there was Mario. I didn't know that there was cameras behind the the mirrors in the in the locker room. So then that's my little pre warm up, and then they took a picture and put it outside. <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, going back to the schedule, so we have our vascular conference until about like quarter to eight, and then we go to operating from eight till whenever. Uh, it can go until four o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. Then after that, we review all the cases for the next day, so that could take another hour or two. So then we usually are there about nine to ten. Uh, now that's because you're not on call. If you're on call, then basically, you know, you could be operating again from whenever you're done reviewing your cases for the next day until two o'clock, three o'clock. Uh, so it's a little bit different when you're as a fellow because the, the hours don't necessarily apply to you, um, how many hours you're working. Because obviously everything you're doing now as a fellow is going to carry over to your practice when you're done. Um, but anyway, so that's the usual day for me at least. Um, yeah, so we'll have uh, Mikey do his grand intro. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I mean, he's really here at St. Francis, uh, and so I really wanted you to do a welcome, just a brief welcome. But we're sort of, we've sort of recapped a few things, uh, if you want to incorporate those in your remarks, is sort of when you felt really confident that surgery was your calling, uh, anything that really made that transformation from yeah, maybe I want to do it to, yes, this is it. It was when he was doing it with me. Well, I, thought I, was was me <laughs> I thought when you saw me do a lap coli, you were like, dang. I want to be like, this is when he was doing it with me. This is part of the It says uh, surgery and culture. That's right. That's right. So yes, just any, any, anything you want. All right, hey, why, why you're late? 
Well, that's right. Well, I, I apologize for being late. Um, Mike Jimenez, Mikey Jimenez, all, all my very good friends call me Mikey. Um, so, welcome to St. Francis. Welcome to Southeast Los Angeles. Um, I am a trauma surgeon here. So, the reason I was late is because we, I, I happen to be on call today. Now, today was one of those days where it was split, so I worked from 7 in the morning to 7 p.m., and we were in the middle of sign out. And of course, we never really get too many traumas at shift change. It just, it doesn't happen for some reason, but today, of course, we got three. So, I was in between seeing traumas and trying to, to, to sign out to a partner who's, who's taken over, so that's why I'm, I'm a little late. But um, this is a, a, a great hospital. We do a bunch of great work here. Um, we are a level two trauma center. Um, so pretty much any, any motor vehicle collision, stab wound, gunshot wound in this, in SPA 6, this area of LA that, that we call uh, SPA 6, which encompasses Compton, Watts, Linwood, Southgate, and Paramount. Any trauma in our catchment area comes here. Um, we're very proud of our work here, uh, and I'm happy that you guys are all here. It's so, it's so great to see uh, so many young faces and people wanting to go into medicine. We need, we need more minorities in medicine without question. So seeing you guys here is just inspiring to, to, to me. So I'm, I'm glad if Ayin and we put together a great cast. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've known Simon for many years. He was my senior med student, and Luis is a good friend of mine too. He was a, a couple years ahead of me in training, and I actually got to go uh, do some of my first surgeries with, with, with Luis, actually. He was a, he, Did I let he you was do a resident. Happy? Huh? Did I let you do an happy? Did you he, do your he, first happy with me? This is true. I just got <laughs> This is true. He let me do an happy. Um, and, an uh, appendectomy. Yeah, an appendectomy. He, uh, he didn't let me do too much of, of, of the lab coli. But at least it was. <laughs> you got a photograph. Got a you got a photograph with your appendix. That's true. Yeah, yeah, I did. That's true. Um, um, so it's very good to uh, be here. Um, uh, here at St. Francis, I'm a I'm a trauma surgeon. I'm a surgical critical care uh, intensivist, and uh, I'm a general surgeon. Um, what I was going to tell about myself? What inspired me to go into into medicine? A combination of things. I I used to say, you know, these elaborate answers, and I think it all comes down to. Uh, some goals that I said as I was a kid, I had great mentors, my parents were hard workers, um, I had people that were along the way telling me that I can do it, and I also had people along the way telling me I couldn't do it, which gave me some more energy as well. Um, but getting, getting together with, with great friends, people who think alike, people who, who, who encouraged me to, to get here, whether it was my senior medical students or whether it was good friends who were, who were residents who were, who were in the same field that, that, that I wanted to go into, um, and people like Efrain and Lucian and, and some of the people that went to medical school with me, we all kind of helped each other and pushed each other. There's times where you kind of take some stumbles, some falls. Um, I did a post back, um, was able to do good work there and get into med school. I took the MCAT twice, didn't do so hot the uh, first time. And you know, with the help of some, some people here, Luis would tell me, yo, you gotta take a course. You know, and I took a course, got in, and uh, here I am, here I am today. I'm the, Associate Trauma Director here at, at, at St. Francis. Um, very, very proud of that and very happy to be serving in an underserved area. Um, so this is all possible. Get yourself uh, mentors, people that you can ask questions about, people who have done it before you because no need to reinvent the wheel. People already invented wheels of fire and things like that. So don't try to do it on your own. And all it takes is, is, is someone, just a simple call, simple email, um, and surrounding yourself with people with interests such as yourself and how you're doing today. I think being a part of a Mimentor is fantastic. Um, Efrain's doing a fantastic job with this. I think just getting the word out that we can do it too. If you try hard, listen, we came from different backgrounds. Some of us weren't as privileged as others who were able to go to these private schools and get the education that needed to go to these great undergrads and go to med school. You know, some of us had to do it the, the, the hard way. But there's no right route. As long as you don't give up on what you're trying to do, you will get there. Uh, and then we were just uh, continue on uh, on the day to day routine, and focusing sort of on your typical day, not the extreme days. I know some days like today for you is really uh, extreme in the sense that you're here, or maybe not. Maybe this is a typical day. Uh, but if you could describe, maybe we'll go with Claudia and then come back. Yeah, sure. Your typical day. <laughs> and we'll circle back. My day changes, you know, every day. Sometimes we're in the OR, sometimes we're in clinic. If I'm in the OR, it's very similar to what he described. You know, you wake up early, you round on the patients you do have, and you go to the OR, you're in there till who knows when, you get out, you round on your patients again, you review the cases for the next day. 
Um, on the days I'm not in the OR, I'm in clinic, so usually start around 6 to, pre to round on your patients again, then your clinic starts at like 8. And the cool thing about urology is we do a lot of procedures in our clinic too, so we're seeing patients for things like enlarged prostates or kidney stones, and then we're also doing a lot of procedures where we're actually getting to do hands-on stuff, like place ureteral stents for kidney stones that are blocked, or doing a prostate biopsy in a man who might have prostate cancer. So it's kind of cool because it's a little bit of everything. And then usually on clinic days, I'm done by five seeing patients, you round again, you catch up on a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork that they don't tell you that about. Um, <laughs> and then finish, you know, seven or eight. If you're on call, my call's a little different because I don't actually stay at the hospital, so I take my pager home with me, and then if I get called in the middle of the night, I have to come back to the hospital. So it just, it depends. Some surgical subspecialties, you're gonna be required to stay at the hospital overnight, and then you get to go home early the next day. Uh, for urology, it's a little different, so a little bit easier, so we actually take home call because there's not that many urologic emergencies, so that's kind of the nice thing. So I'm a couple years out of training, know that nine years that I told you guys about, um, and my typical day is on office days is nine to four, five. I see patients. Um, I might see 15, 20 patients in the day. Some, some new patients, some follow-ups. Um, so not too bad in that regard. There's a lot of paperwork, though, that goes involved with that. So sometimes I might stay a little late to do some of the paperwork, either from the day before or the day after, uh, dictate some cases. And then my operative days, I tend to start at 7 in the morning, and I'll operate till 3, 4. Usually by 4, I'm done. So of the surgical specialties, I'm probably the one that works the least right now, but I'm also starting my practice, so I'm not as busy as I'd like to be. I, I mean, I'm, it's busy enough, but it, it can get a lot busier. My partner, uh, my senior partner, I mean, he will work a lot more uh, because he's got the patient base. Uh, I've got a good patient base, but I, it's not killing me yet, so I can decide how much I want to push that. If I want to do seven, eight cases in a day, I can. I can work, I can operate till six, seven at night. But um, right now, I don't have that many patients. And if I do get them, I can decide, you know, either up my price and and do less cases um, or just do more cases. You know, there's flexibility. That's the nice part. Yeah, I was just getting flashbacks from all Residents. Yeah, no, I was like, oh, God, I'm so glad I'm done with that. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one year out from my training. Uh, I'm in private practice. Uh, my lifestyle's pretty good. Um, I'm also building my patient base. Uh, I typically operate uh, two times a week right now. Um, I specialize in joint replacements. So usually I do uh, anywhere from two to three hip, shoulder, or knee replacements uh, during that day. Uh, the rest of the time I'm in clinic. Right now it's about 8.30 to 4 or 5, between 20 and 30 patients. But my partners are definitely uh, way busier than I am. So eventually you build up, but, but you have full control. I mean, I can say, look, I only want to see max 35 patients per clinic. I only want two or three clinics a week. I want to operate, you know, so, so you have full control. It's not like in residency where you're kind of at the mercy of uh, whatever happens on that day. So, uh, in terms of call, I, I operate at a smaller community hospital, so the call is not too bad. I cover like a weekend, uh, one, week, <coughs> one weekend a month, and maybe a few days during the week. Uh, it's not a level, I don't even think it's a level two, so I see a lot of um, like hip fractures, things like that. Not a lot of open fractures or something you would see at a big trauma center. Um, but you know, I made that decision. Um, some of my colleagues, some of my friends wanted to do orthopedic trauma, and so they're at you know County USC or big trauma center. And, you know, their lifestyle is a little bit different. So you know, you have control over that. So I'd say right now things are kind of exactly how I wanted them to be. Um, but when I was in residency, I, you know, I, man, I, I couldn't imagine that things would, would change, but they can.
I didn't mention call. Um, I don't take call at the hospitals that I'm part of. They're not mandatory for plastics. I thought about it. I just haven't done it. I enjoy my weekends and my evenings. Um, <laughs> we can we can hire you if you want to call. We're going to buy some surgery. I'm going to buy some surgery. They're going out, so listen. Yeah. Well, we can talk about that, actually. <laughs> uh, I do volunteer my time at USC, so there I do take some call just to keep my, my big reconstructive skills going because um, sometimes when you're in private practice in plastics and you're just doing a bunch of aesthetic surgery, you can lose the skills that are necessary to do big reconstructive surgery. And I did a fellowship in, in huge reconstructive surgery stuff, so I don't want to lose those skills. So um, there is an altruistic point of, of you know trying to volunteer and help the residents out and help the community out at, at County USC, but there's also part that's selfish for me in trying to keep my skills and that skill set that I, I want to be a real plastic surgeon that puts big things that are screwed up back together. Um, and I don't want to lose them. And not yet, at least. Your typical day. Typical day, um, it depends. If I'm in the ICU, uh, my job is to, is to take care of both the patients that are in there because of a, of a, of a pathology having to do with trauma. So if there's, you know, bad damage that went to the chest or to the abdomen or damage to the aorta or one of the vital organs and the patient's examining, they'll get placed in the intensive care unit. If they're on the ventilator, then I'll go ahead and manage their entire state. Also, we do, I, I also do surgery with critical care, which is if a patient has a big surgery, um, and they can't just go to, to a regular floor, if, again, if they're on a ventilator, or if they're critically ill, or if they're on certain drugs, where they have to be watching minute to minute, then they're going to go to, to the ICU. So when I'm the ICU doctor, um, my typical day starts at 7, goes from 7 to 7, anywhere from 8 to like 15, 15 to 16 patients. Um, I usually spend about an hour on each of those patients, um, maybe 45 minutes. Uh, the thing is, that, again, those patients are, are critically ill, you know, I'm moving the ventilator one day, or sometimes we regress, patient got pneumonia or an infection. So I have to figure out what, what's going on with him besides what brought them into to, to, to the hospital. So I do about uh, six or seven of those um, shifts per, per, per month. So I do an entire week in the intensive care unit. When I'm not in the intensive care unit, um, I also do about a week of uh, call from, from, from the ER for, for general surgery. So whether someone comes in with appendicitis or an incarcerated hernia or a perforated colon cancer or stomach cancer, um, I'll, I'll basically take that person to, 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 to the operating room. Now when I'm on call for surgery, I don't have to be here like in, in the house. I, I can be at home. Um, I usually have a, a few patients that are, that are here in the hospital and I'll come in and make rounds, but I can be at home and if I can call a um, 16 year old kid has appendicitis, I'll drive in, take out the appendix, Go back home and wait until they call me again. And I also do some some elective surgery. So if someone has like an umbilical hernia or an inguinal hernia, or has issues with their gallbladder, I'll see them in my office and I'll and I'll and I'll schedule them and I'll do it as an as, as an elective case. I do about again seven calls in the ICU, about five to seven calls uh, as a general surgeon, and then about five to six calls as a as a trauma surgeon. When you're a trauma surgeon, you have to be in house. Um, when, when I say that we're a level, two, a level two trauma center, you know, some people think, well, why aren't, why aren't you guys level one? You see so much crime here. Um, you have to take, in order to be a level one trauma center, you have to have an, an academic training program. We don't have uh, general surgery residents or ER residents, which is, which, is, which is one of the criteria that, that you have to have. Um, but we take care of everything. So any kind of fracture, any kind of, you know, gunshot wound or stab wound comes here. So on that day, again, the, the shift starts at seven, and it usually doesn't end until, until, uh, until 7 o'clock until the following morning. So unlike residency, or like residency, where we're a crazy amount of hours, and where I trained, we, we weren't so, we weren't so uh, strict with the 80-hour uh, a week rule. I'm not sure if that was a good or bad thing, but anyway, we, we were crazy more hours than that. And when I trained as a, as a trauma fellow over in, in Baltimore, Maryland, shot trauma, <laughs> is, it, is this, this is going to be on TV? <laughs> so maybe or record his own. Maybe I shouldn't say the hour, about the hour thing. I don't want to get them trouble. But anyway, we were crazy hours. As a trauma surgeon, it's kind of like that. Um, you kind of live and die by what happens in, in in trauma in your catchment area. So some days, you know, you get about four or five traumas. It could be small motor vehicle collisions. Um, you admit some. You send some home. You you evaluate them, and it's not that bad of a day. Probably like a Tuesday or Wednesday. 
But as you get closer to the weekend, you know, people do bad things to, to themselves on the weekends, on the holidays, and at night. So <laughs> it, gets, it gets crazy. So, I mean, one day, I, it just, it, it's, it's kind of hit and miss, but mainly hit. We have the highest penetrating uh, trauma in all of Southern California is here at St. Francis, which is part of the reason why, you know, and I, and I interviewed at SC at Harvard UCLA, at Cedar sinai and a place in Texas and up north. But what drove me to come to this place here, to St. Francis, um, number one was the patient population, minority people here. And I wanted to get back to that community. Number two is the volume of penetrating trauma. It's insane, it's almost 40%. No other trauma center in Southern California, no other trauma center has those numbers. It's ridiculous. Um, not to knock on USC, I know at least you're, you're at USC, but, or, or at least you work part on USC. They, they, part of the lure that I thought of USC is that there's so much penetrating trauma. Not so much, there's, there, there are mainly blood trauma there, but the penetrating trauma that we see here is insane. So on, on a typical day that gets bad, and it's 50-50, you can go to the operating room about six, seven everything. times. You get everything that MLK used to get, that's mm -hmm. why. Exactly, Because MLK exactly. used to be the place, and I mean, the military used to train at MLK. Yep, but, this is true. So that's what's that's what happening. Yep, and that's exactly what happened. Since MLK unfortunately went down, then this place would saw kind of scant trauma here and there, things that happened kind of in this, just in Linwood would come here. But now they've absorbed Compton and Watson with the Woodbrook area and Paramount and Southgate and even all the way to Whittier. So things that used to go to MLK, this is true because MLK used to be the place. And the military, the, I mean everyone, people from even international people would come over to get a trauma experience because the penetrating trauma there was unbelievable. So now we get that. The government um, built an OR. They built their OR suite right there to train their military it, students. That place is, is if, 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 if you think about it, it's, I mean, if we were there. And that place is Excalibur. It's like the best sword you can ever think of. That, that, that trauma center was built like I've never seen. A trauma bay that was state of the art. Brand new, remember they had yep. barely made Brand it. New. So the trauma bay's there, the, 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 the radiology department's there, the ICU's around the corner, and so is the OR. So you never had to go up, like here we, in most hospitals, you gotta go to, to do a different floor, so we're pushing the gurney on a patient, patient who's exsanguinated, or a patient whose chest was cracked open, and did open cardiac massage and put a clamp on the aorta, and we're running up to, to like the, well not running up, but we're taking the elevator up to the second floor and going, and going to the operating room. We're at, we're at King when it was up and running. Everything is right there. It was designed perfect. It's how it's supposed to be, but anyway. So a day in trauma, it could be, you, you can, there's times, I say 50 to 60% of the times you don't, you can maybe get an hour of sleep. If that, it's just nuts. I'm operating all the time. What I like about trauma surgery is that it's very versatile. I'm operating in the abdomen, I operate in the chest, I do vascular surgery as well. And anything above the knees, I take care of. So any damage to the big arteries in your legs, I'll take care of that. Any damage to the chest, in fact, we just had a save of the day, which is the save of, of my life. Me and my, and my, and my boss, Dr. Dr. Shepard, we, we had a patient that was, um, I think he had 14 holes in his, in, in his body. Two holes in the heart, he was shot. I mean, numerous in, in, uh, holes in the intestines. So n not only did we do an exposure lobotomy, uh, we took out his kidney, we controlled the hemorrhage there. We didn't think there was anything wrong with the, with, with the heart at first. The fast was negative, we don't have to get into the technicality, but we did a study that we didn't think there was anything wrong with the heart. Well, lo and behold, the patient started crashing. We did a, a thoracotomy and realized there was two holes in the heart. So we sewed the heart. Um, it, 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 at the end of the day, he made it. He walked out about three weeks later. But we repaired his heart. We took out half of his um, pancreas. We took out his spleen. We took out his kidney. We took out a bunch of intestines. We took out his colon. And the guy's eating again. And for, for me to be able to do all of that, to have the, the training to take care of all of that, is what drew me into trauma. And more so, <laughs> would call me to, to come back here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But, so, but, but not all I don't want to scare everyone to trauma. I think, it's, I think it's the, I mean, I like what I do, although I don't, everyone else does as well. Obviously, it wouldn't be in the field if they did it. But not all trauma locations are, are like that. This is one of the few places, there's only about four or five places in the country that have this kind of volume, this kind of penetrating trauma. Um, so, my day is like, there's never a regular day. It's just fair. And, uh, yeah, Mikey has two little very active boys. Oh. <laughs> two, two and... Yeah. One? No, oh, you know, three, three, three and one. Three and one. Yeah. Both. Well, yeah. Those, those, those guys will give the uh, energizer bunny a run for them for for its money. Let me tell you something. We'll get some energy. But uh, I, you know, I think you know, I really appreciate your guys' sincerity, passion, and what you do. 
Um, and I, I know you guys also live very uh, normal lives, and that's why you guys are my friends, because you're normal people. <laughs> but I, Even though he's not that normal. Yeah. No, but, but you can hear, again, I think in their descriptions, how passionate they are about what they do. So I want to open this up to, to some questions before we wrap up. Um, so any, any questions out there from the audience, anything you can think of, that could, anything's fair game, there's no such thing as a silly question, um, just to kind of get you guys uh, awake and uh, thinking about surgery. Uh, how did one of you guys get in touch and develop your relationship with the mentors that helped you out through medical school and residency? I think the key word to use is mentor. Um, people that truly look at themselves as mentors, they make themselves available to you. So, you know, although some people will have a lot of prestige, they've done a lot of work in whatever field you're interested in, and they seem ideal, but if they don't make themselves available to you, then they really don't serve that purpose of a mentor. So a mentor for you has to be, at least that's the way I think of it, is that somebody that is always available, is able to answer your questions, and really takes into account what you want and what you need, and is able to guide you. So I think that's really the person that you see as a mentor is someone that is really available to you, and that's really what you should find. Um, and what are the you're available to Someone that knows the ropes ahead of you so you don't make the same mistakes kind of deal. I think he's asking how we met them, and I think you find them just along the road. You know, as, as when you're in college, you find someone that's ahead of you who took the MCAT, and then you're like, how do you? What is the MCAT? What? How did you do well in it? And then once you do that, then you 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 know, it might be the same group of people that just keep going ahead of you. But you, I did a summer program and met this guy Rudy, who's a fertility doctor. He was the first guy I met who was in medical school, and now he's still my friend. And he's, I met him, and I was like, dude. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be a doctor, like you, you're, you're a normal dude just like I am. So then if you can do it, I can do it too, you know? And he's from Sacramento, went to Cal State. I mean, it's like, it, he went to a public school, and his, you know, his, parent, his parents are very similar to mine. And it's like, okay, well, I can do it too. And it's just, and then each, each time you find someone else that's available. They don't have to be available all the time, but just available, you just shoot them an email question and they can answer it and help you so that you don't make the same mistakes that maybe they've seen and done or have done themselves. I think one good way to get started is just join whatever pre-medical group you can get involved with, even if it's associated with some kind of ethnicity, whether it's like CCM, you know, or anything, just join it so you can at least start making contacts. CCM, LMSA, there were yeah. Latino-based organizations that I got involved with in undergrad medical school where I got a huge amount of mentorship and I was able to mentor in return. Um, and I thought they were fantastic and, and probably the biggest reason why I'm, I'm here today. And also I think one of the things to keep in mind is that obviously the, you know, the program that has put this together for you guys, which is COPE, you know, uh, COPE Health Solutions, you know, my feedback to you is that I was very involved with them since day one when they actually started creating clinical care extenders and you know you guys can always use this as, a, as one of your advantages over all other pre-med students to get the exposure that you need and find those mentors because you may work with certain doctors that are maybe in the field that you're interested in you can ask questions and they may guide you you know to different people that they know so really take this experience that you guys have here and try to get as much exposure and try to meet as many people as you can. You never know who's going to be, as these guys said. It's going to be the person that you're going to be friends with for life, that they you know, were able to mentor you, they were available when you needed them to ask questions, to, uh, they're able to be in touch with the right people. I mean, you know, all of us have gone through mentors and or through networking uh, through them, through the friends that they've had. So it's really, you know, it's really important that what you guys are in is really a quality, quality place uh, that really provides you all the things that you guys need. So I think that you know you guys are you guys are doing it right. And then, That's for sure. And then what what is it, it just kind of add a little bit to 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 what Luis said as well. What Sam just said. Um, there's just like you have short-term goals and long-term goals. There's kind of not short-term mentors, but you know there's there's mentors that you'll run into that you can ask for advice that are kind of already where, where you want to be. Now, if, if, if you're pre-med 
uh, or if you're getting into med school or you know you, you're at a JC, it's going to be hard to know if you want to be a nurse surgeon, a vascular surgeon, a plastic surgeon, you know, a dermatologist. You're not going to really know that yet. But you know that your goal is to get into, in, into medical school. So you get a, a not a short-term mentor, but someone who's kind of been there already. You ask them, like, I asked a friend of mine, I want to take the MCAT for the first time. I literally went in there, sat there, and took it. So then, you know, obviously I called, I called one of my buddies. He was, he was a friend in my fraternity who was two years older than me. And, and I, I, I go, look, I didn't score that well. He said, well, what would you do? I'm like, oh, I just I signed up and I took it. <laughs> he's like, you know, he's like, everyone takes a course, you're at a disadvantage if you don't take French Review or Kaplan. Plus, I was a person that needed, you know, I, I work hard, but I needed some sort of a, of, of a structure, of like a structured way of studying. Because you can't just walk into an eight hour test and think you're going to do well. So that was step number one. He was a mentor to me and helping me out in how to study better to do well on this test. I got into medical school, and again, you start speaking to, to some of the people that are in med school a few years older than you. Again, those are short-term mentors or mentors that can get you to the next level or, or where your immediate goal is, which is to do well in medical school. Sammy was, was, was a year ahead of me. We would ask him what to do, what rotation to take, who are good people to talk to, whatever. Things like that that kind of give you an extra little boost in health. You know, then I knew I, I, I wanted to go into surgery, and Luis was, you know, I consider him a very good friend. I went and he, he let me stay free with him over in Arizona when he was in residency in, in, in general surgery. Give me a good first eye view of what a, what, a general, what a general surgery resident does, what they do, and I fell in love with them more. So then, and, and then along the way, I told myself, okay, I knew I, knew I wanted to be a surgeon. So, I know, so now I had a couple of surgeons, especially trauma. I like the fact that they can do everything. So I had a couple of surgeons that were, that were trauma surgeons that mentored me and helped me get in, in, into residency. So each, each step along the way, there's someone that helps you out because no one has an exact map. You just got to figure out what your next goal is, wherever you're at right now. If you're in undergrad, trying to get into, into, into med school, if you're in med school, trying to get into residency, those people, those peers of yours that are just ahead of you are valuable resources in order to help you do well to make sure that you attain uh, your goal. And then there's people who are already in the field that you know you want to go into. You want to make sure you make contact with them. So to, this way you don't make the same mistakes that they made, or you can get just a little edge on you know, easing your way and making your goal a reality. And those mentors can help actively too, like if they're in a position to help, not to bring up a sore subject, but um, Mikey was looking for a position, and uh, we pushed hard to get him into my program where he was, but he chose to go somewhere else. But they can make things happen for you, you know what I mean? And Mikey, Mikey was number one on my list, on our program actually. We ranked him number one wanted him to come to our program. We love Mikey. Where you And he ended up going to another program. Did you believe that? <laughs> He's still my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I got heat for the next two years. They're like, hey, what happened to Chili Willy? <laughs> now like, they're like, what happened to Chili Willy? I'm like, oh, he went to another program. <laughs> but you know, mentors can make things happen for you too. Because if he wanted to come here, if he wanted to come to where, where I trained, he had the shot. He had an opportunity. And, and not that he wouldn't have ended up number one without my help, but it did help for me to push. Oh, no, definitely. Push. No question. It did help for me to push, you know? And that's how I got into medical school, too. I had someone some, someone inside that helped push me up the ladder, so. I think you bring up a, a couple of good points. Uh, that is, it's a small world, and you guys are all going to work with each other, and some of you guys will mentor each other, and so don't burn any bridges. Yes. No, that's <laughs> yes. that is something to say. I was going to say, you got to put yourself out there too. Like, um, I mean, I'm still kind of a shy person, but man, in undergrad and med school, I was super shy. And, but now, you know, you can sh always shoot somebody an email, and um, it's probably the, the easiest way to do it. But you got to go out there and, and volunteer, join groups, and meet people. Uh, if you just think about it, it's just never going to happen. So, and once you, you make one mentor or one person, that person knows other people, and you start making a network, and, and you kind of find the, the right uh, mentors and people that are going to help you. And, and, and it is a small world. Like I, I've been surprised, because uh, once you finish training, I mean, you think you're done with training, and you're like, oh, you know, screw all those people, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get credentialed at hospitals, you got to apply for licenses, and the first thing you ask is for references. And not only do they ask for references, but then, you know, if you train somewhere, they're like, oh, I know someone there, and they'll call that person. And that might be the person that you said, screw you, you know? So, don't burn bridges. <laughs> Come back to bite you. Never see that. I think, yeah, that's another really good uh, point that you guys are raising, is uh, the fact that if you don't really share, 
if you don't tell someone you're struggling, if you don't share that you're having trouble with some issue, then it's really hard for people to help you. I think as a pre-med, you feel like you have to show up once you get a 4.0, once you get a 40 on the MCAT, once you have all these like stars, right? Um, and we all know that that's not really the reality. Um, we all struggle with some part of our application somehow. And it's about finding people to help you you know, figure out a way to compensate for that or, or find a way to strengthen those, those weaknesses. And so, you know, keep that in mind that um, for me, a lot of the mentoring opportunities was a discussion about something I was having trouble with. It was never about something good, usually. <laughs> uh, not like, oh, I got a name, so let's talk. And they're like, okay, you got a name, that's great. It was usually like, well, you know, I have, I'm going to decide between this volunteer experience and this research experience, and I really don't know which one's good for me. How do I decide this? And then they're saying, oh, well, you know, this is how I did it. And then you kind of pick something up. So with that, I, I want to be respectful of your guys' time. We've got a few more minutes, but I want to allow you guys to walk up and talk to some of them. Um, they have cards or potentially could share uh, uh, any insights. I know you had a question, so maybe you can just come up to the panel and ask some of the folks uh, individually. All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. And uh, we'll have you guys come up.